שלום everyone, and today we are studying Parashat Kitisa, a very tough one, uh, because Parashat Kitisa, you can find it by the way, in the book of Exodus chapter 30, verse 11. Uh, Parashat Kitisa is, is discussing many, many topics. However, within these topics, we have the most uh, touchy one, the most... Uh, sensitive one, it is the story of the golden calf. Just to get the picture, the Israelites are going for about a year of uh, a journey with the uh, Egyptians as Moses is being told to go to Pharaoh, tell him, let my people go. So it takes about a year till of, and 10 plagues till the Israelites leave Egypt. Then seven weeks walking the desert, and on the 50th day, after the 10th plague, after the Exodus, Mount Sinai Revelation. Moses goes up to the mount for 40 days, and on the last day, uh, it looks like the Israelites are losing patience, and you can find it in chapter 32, Exodus, verse 1. And the people saw that Moses is late coming down from the mount. So the people gathered on Aaron, Moses' brother, get up and make us a God that will lead us. Because that guy, Moses, that person that got us out, out from the land of Egypt, we have no idea what happened to him. Somebody goes up for the mountain in the desert for 40 days, he's, he's probably dead. So if they just, and the word boshesh, uh, there's a game over here of words, because boshesh means late, but it's also beshesh on the sixth hour, like he was six hours late. I don't want to go into it too much, we could do the details because we need to cover the real issue over here. And the real issue is that it says that Aaron says, you want me to make you a God, bring your gold, the uh, jewels, and they bring the jewels they give it to Aaron, and he makes a golden calf. And they say, I'm reading in verse, uh, chapter 32, verse 3, and they say, these are your God, Israel, El Eloecha Israel, Asher Elucha Meret Mitzrayim, that got you out of the land of Egypt. Vaya Aaron, vayiven mizbeach lefanav, and Aaron builds a, 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 an altar, and he announced, Vayomar Chag Ladonai Machal. Tomorrow we are doing a festival to God. Okay. Uh, then they got up in the morning and they started to celebrate and they were eating and drinking. Uh, Look, sir, 40 days later, 40 days after Mount Sinai Revelation. How could that happen? Each one of us, every normal human being is saying, if I was there and I would go through all this process of 10 plagues in Egypt and the miracle of walking in the desert and the pillar of, smoke, of cloud walking in front of the camp and the uh, pillar of fire and then at night, and then crossing the sea, the Red Sea, the miracle of the Red Sea, and Mount Sinai Revelation, we spoke about it so much for the last uh, uh, eight weeks. Less. Uh, yes, so how could that happen to us? How could that happen to anyone? Okay, and this is what the topic is uh, about, because if we're going right now to start trying to uh, have gossip, about the Israelites some 33 centuries ago, uh, it says very clearly in our sages' wisdom, do not ever judge 
Another person, unless you are in his place and you realize what is he going through. And because we are not in their place, we cannot judge them. The question is, the Torah is eternal. What is the message for us? Is the Torah telling us gossip about the terrible stuff the Israelites did in the desert in making a golden calf after Mount Sinai revelation? Or is it a message for us, for each one of us, about our own spiritual journey? And that is the true answer. So uh, let me just read a little bit more to see the result, the, you know, the uh, context of the story. And God speaks to Moses, that's verse 7. Lech red kishichet amcha. Get down, because your people is, became corrupt. Now you have to remember that Rabbi Azak Gloria is teaching us that Moses was a reincarnation of Noah. And the people there that got out of Egypt, they were reincarnated from the people of Noah's generation. The legend says that when Noah came out of the ark and he saw the devastation, the disaster, that no one survived, and he cries, and he cries to God, why? Why did you do something like this? And God is saying, you're crying now? Why didn't you cry before? Why didn't you try, do you cry and protect them before? So Noah came back as Moses, and the people came back as those people. Uh, one of the reasons that the, the baby born were supposed to be thrown into the Nile because their tikkun of being drowned uh, was not finished. So the, the word kishichet amcha, when it says, let my people go, God says to Moses, go and get my people out. Now when they sin, God is telling Moses, that's your people. What's your people? Shichet. The word shichet, that corrupt, is the same verb exactly being used in the story of Noah. That the whole uh, humanity got corrupted. The same word exactly, shichet. Which means Moses over here has an opportunity to make a correction. He didn't cry he didn't try to protect, he didn't try to change the course of history. When he was Noah, now he got another chance. And so we get already one concept. You always have another chance. You always, you will always find yourself in all kinds of situations that basically give you all of these, even the most horrible, unbelievable situations, all of them are there for a purpose, and you are the purpose, giving each one of us another opportunity, because that's what every day's life is about. It's about facing those difficulties, those corrections. We need to correct and turning the trouble into a victory. Uh, and you see, you see it going on, verse 9, chapter 32. Vayomer Adonai Moshe ra'idi et ha'am azeh v'hine am k'she'orefu. And God says to Moses, I saw this nation. They are very stubborn people, hard-neck people. He's God, you don't know that? You just found out? Surprise! Why is God talking like this, like he's surprised? Ve'ata, and now, verse 10, Hanichani, leave me alone, ve'ichar api ba'em and ma'al get my anger into them, ve'achale ma'adi al erase them, ve'eseh otcha le'goy gadol, and I'll make you a big nation. Isn't that the same like in Noach? But one thing, let, let, us, let us read what the Zohar is saying. The Zohar expands on it. He's saying like this. Verse uh, 50 in the Zohar, Perusha Sulam, on Parashat Kitisa. 
So we have an amazing uh, uh, angle to see, to understand that situation we're talking about in Parashat Kitisa, in the Zohar, Perush HaSulam, the Sulam Commentary, verse 50. Amar Rabbi Yosef. Rabbi Yosef said, Lava Barachman al Benoy de Kucha Brihu, Ukrao, Dichtiv, Donafal de Varechad Michot Varoa Tove Gomer. Tachaze Yachmanu delay, Ilo Amar Lonafal de Varechad Michot Varo Veloyatir, Noach Lama de Light Bari. Aval mi de Amar Michol Dvaroa Tove, a pig bish la Hora, de Amila de Vish la Bae Lemeba. Translation. There's no merciful father like God. How do we know that? One of the, uh, we get it from a verse of a, the book of Kings, chapter 8, where it says, uh, whatever the good sayings of the Creator, nothing of them has been uh, uh, did not come true. What does it mean? Come and see the mercy of God. If it says that whatever God said, whatever God says, um, there is everything has to come out, come through, and more not nothing more than that. Okay, well, that means, because the original verse says, nothing of the good words of God. It didn't say everything. Nothing of the good words of God. Which means, it doesn't include the punishments and the curses. If that was the case, the world was better not to be created. Because there was no way that anyone, anyone could stand the uh, all of those... Uh, all of the punishments of God. However, it says from all the good words that he said, and what does it mean? That whatever bad words that were said, they were said for a purpose, but not they're not supposed to happen. Which means all the bad things that God says, and the, the, the Bible is full of them, not all of them came true. What does it mean? We can see from here his mercy. Because the bad stuff, that's not, he has no interest to do them. Verse 51, and even though he make, he got uh, angered, like it doesn't say anger, but he scared. The whole thing is that wherever we see in the, in the Bible that God is like reacting with anger, we have to understand God never reacts, okay? He is endless light. So what is this anger? And the answer is very simple. It is a warning to scare. Why do you need to be scared? Because otherwise, how would you learn that you're making a mistake? It's a, otherwise, it's not that you have to see that there's a system of cause and effect. It's like a father who wants to scare the son, really did something really, really dangerous, like walking on the balcony, okay? Or uh, trying to play with fire. So he raises his belt to scare the child. And now comes the mother and says, no, 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 it's enough. You, know, you won't do it again. Just have mercy for him. So the whole thing is a game between the father and the mother in order to get the child to understand that what was done was really serious and shouldn't repeat itself. So, <clears throat> and the judgment did not come out. Why? Because the father and the mother were in, it was a show that the father was getting, re making things really scary. And the mother was kind of like, you know, give him another chance. He really regrets, he understood it. Let's give, you know, let's say, don't hit him. Let's continue. And if you say that, how would you know that? 
How do we know that? And the answer is that it says really clearly, as it says, as we read just before in that verse, verse, nine, uh, verse 10, chapter 32, where it says, come down because your people got corrupted, then it's like God is raising the belt. Moses did not know that his job is to play the mother. And he was not, and he was like, oh my God, it's happening and what can I do? It's horrible. It's like, they did something really bad. I don't know if that can be uh, repaired. So Moses, as well says, was standing there in, in shock. When God saw that, God hinted him, it's your chance. How? He says, and now let me do that. He was hinting, and Moses realized, why are you saying let me do that? It depends on me. Then Moses immediately felt, and he held like, he held God's raised arm to hit. And he said, and then he started to uh, talk to God. No, you cannot do that. It's impossible. You just spent so much in, a, in saving them from Egypt. What, what will the other nation will say? Your project is too dear to you. And then God said, then again, maybe not. Okay? Which means the whole thing is that Moses had his own tikkun to realize. He has to get up and fight for his people, like he did not fight in the previous lifetime. And also to understand that when it looks like God is very, very angry, that's a show how to educate naughty children. So when we understand that, then we can uh, move on to understand the story itself. Because if we follow the story we have on one hand, the great guilt of the Israelites. On the other hand, you have Moses begging for forgiveness. And finally, the whole story comes out. The story happens on the 17th day of Tammuz, uh, the Hebrew sign of cancer, or the month of cancer. The story completes itself when Moses comes down from the mount second time with a second set of tablets with the same, almost the same, uh, 10 utterances written on the tablets. But he comes down on Yom Kippur and he comes down with the great gift that is called forgiveness. Some sages are saying, the story of the golden calf had to happen in order to give every human being that idea that there's nothing terrible that a person can do that cannot be atoned and should not and cannot be corrected. Even something like this, like here you have such lack of gratitude. And you know, how many people say, if just God came down from the mount, made me a miracle, I will be righteous forever. I'm sure that you know either very, very intimately someone that miracles were done to them, to that person, and the moment of realizing the miracle is like, I will be grateful forever. And then could be moments later, or maybe days later, and you find yourself in a place of like, like everything is like it was before. Why is the Torah telling us this story? The Torah is telling us this story because we have to understand. As I said before, uh, on, uh, on Parashat Ito. Mount Sinai revelation started as the nation of Israel is united as one person with one heart. When God started to speak, everybody's souls got out of them and 
had an out-of-body experience and the interaction between the millions of the souls of the Jewish people that were on Mount Sinai with God, the result was the two tablets. The question is like this. If they were out of their body and they saw the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, but the really the whole truth, which means all the construction of the universe, the whole programming of the universe, the rules of cause and effect, as we learn in Parashat Ito. Why did we have to come back? Back to what? To the physical body? To yeah, making breakfast? Uh, uh, dealing with the uh, earache of the baby? Like, after being in such heights of epiphany of like, it's higher than any prophecy that any human being experienced ever. And now coming back again to the body, that you have to smell the smells of this world, to see the limited sides of this world, it's so limited. I, I said it many times, you see sometimes, you know, a baby just born a few days old, and it's like making these faces, what is this place? It's like, where am, where am I? It's horrible. It's disgusting. Why? Because when you come from such a lofty place outside your body, from the upper worlds, and you come down, everything looks like uh, where I'm doing, what I'm doing here. But we have to remember the purpose of the whole story. We go back to chapter 1 in Genesis. And over there in verse 5, where it says, and God, and there was a night, there was a day, one day. The whole creation from God's point of view was already complete, finished, perfect. We couldn't stand it. Why? Because the hint comes later on, as we learned many, many, many times, we were created in his image. When he, the creator, gave us his light and expanded, Tended, expanded into what became the vessel, our souls, the desire to receive his bliss. He, as is endless, so he could not give but everything, including himself. And that's why it says in the image of God, we, he imprinted himself in us. And therefore, as human beings, we are here not really to enjoy his light. We're here to enjoy his light by creating it on our own. And therefore, we need the challenge. We need the imperfection. We need that limited, disgusting body that is full of all kinds of very low desires that are basically making our life a nightmare sometimes. Either depression, hunger, uh, all of those very low animalistic emotions that really humiliate us daily. Why coming back to that place? We've been on Mount Sinai. Why didn't we stay up there? And the answer is because the purpose is not just enlightenment, is how getting the enlightenment. And the, and the answer is you have to be in the physical body with all the noise and the disruption and all the uh, illusions and the fear and the lust and all of those really humiliating attributes of the body. And you need to realize them, overcome them, ascend above them, and achieve the victory of achieving enlightenment in spite and because of all the disruptions. This is a story. And if you don't understand that story, you can't figure out life. You can't figure out why things happen to people. And then you ask, why do bad things happen to good people? There's no... The purpose of this world is not that everything will be nice and fuzzy and warm 
with hugs and loves. That's not the purpose. Oh, we, the purpose of this world is achieving that after overcoming all the challenges, all the disruptions. And the most of the disruption is the evil inclination, the limitations of the body. So we need the body. We must have a body. We must have all of those. And if the body will stop disturbing, it's not doing its job. So now that we know the whole thing, Mount Sinai, Revelation, we got the Torah, we got all the rules. Does that mean that we simply by knowing logically the rules or even having the epiphany of seeing those, is this the end of the story? And here is the message. It doesn't end the story. Uh, let me give you, uh, share with you a, one of the most amazing texts that were written by the, uh, the Opte Rebbe, Ohev Israel. And he wrote some like really amazing words about it. Uh, and when Moses is saying, the verse is saying to uh, to God, Aaron is on his uh, not so good on his bad side. Okay, uh, where what is the verse? It doesn't say it right here. Okay, it can find it right now, but it does, it's, the point is that Moses is, is begging the creator and he's saying, Aaron is in the bad side. And says, he does say oh, he's evil, he's bad. He says he just took the bad side. Because God forbid, we're not, we're not supposed to speak bad on anyone, because the soul, the souls of Israel that, you know, here we're talking about Moses and the nation of Israel, that came from such a high place, and, and especially Aaron. So if a person is sinning, what does it mean? You cannot blame the person so much. Why did he sin? Not because he has a bad soul. The soul is never evil. The soul was created by the creator, pure, beautiful, and complete. However, the soul had to come into a physical body in order to prove that, in order to overcome the evil inclination. And now when you achieve any kind of revelation, harmony, and epiphany, and enlightenment, it's your creation. And therefore, that's why God cannot give us happiness, success from his side. He wants. He can't. Why? Remember this rule. It says there's no coercion in spirituality. You cannot coerce someone to be happy. You cannot force somebody to be successful. You cannot make somebody uh, feeling good. You, every human being must, as being created in the image of God, you have to create it on your own. So, so the Opti Rebbe continues. So why does did somebody sin? Because he did not yet purify the matter, his materialistic dimension, his body. And therefore his his soul is still captured into that evil part. And it was not sorted out yet, the good from the evil. And so, which what does it mean? We did not 
come to this world, not just that we didn't come to see everything perfect, we did not even come to do it once and for all. There's no once and for all. The process of reaching enlightenment is a gradual process of ongoing purification, sorting out, raising ourselves, ascending from one level to another step by step. This is what human life should be. And therefore, if somebody is sinning, it's because in that round, he failed to overcome the evil, he fell, and now his job is simply to get up and try all over again. Till finally, when you work and work and work gradually, step by step, when you evolve little by little, and that's basically the description, till finally you cleave, you attach yourself to the eternal truth and goodness of the creator for eternally. What does it mean? This needs to be acquired. You need patience. You need to understand that it takes a long road. So when Moses says, again, The whole, please, the whole nation sinned, a very big sin. Most did not say that to speak evil about the Israelites. He said that to show that they understand how terrible is the sin and they're willing to start the journey of correcting it. So the Opta Rebbe continues. So when a person is wise enough to be able to see with his heart, and he will un know and understand truthfully that the biggest punishment for the, for the uh, sin is the, the sin itself. Because when you realize that making that sin disconnected you from the light of the creator, it has no bigger punishment than that. So when a person after a while will settle in his mind and realize what happened, what did he do when he sinned against the creator? What's the will of the creator? To share his light with his creatures. What is the definition of a sin? That the, that the, that the human being disconnects himself from the tree of life and connects himself to evil. And what's wrong with evil? That evil is simply a frequency of selfishness, of death, that the sinner brings death upon himself. It's not a punishment from God. It's like, as we said many times, when somebody puts his finger in the socket, this is against the rules, against the instructions. Who punishes you? The power company? No. It's like simply you go against the rules so that's punishing you. There's no interest for the power company to kill you. They want you to live long and pay your bills. Okay? So when we understand that, that when a person really is aware enough, and that, that doesn't mean that you won't sin anymore. It means that you are on the road, you're on the journey. And then when you realize that you fell into the dark side, <clears throat> if you really understand it, you'll be in shame. And when you're in shame, and when you really feel uh, humility, because you realize how terrible is the mistake you've made, now you regret. And when a person regrets really for the past and will take upon himself the responsibility to be watchful, not to fall again to the same place. And so then as a result, he will get himself more and more into uh, habits that will help him to overcome such, such behavior. 
we understand that this is the greatest way of basically repenting. So it's all about understanding. And that's why the sages are saying in the Talmud, Tractat Brachot, page 54a, when it says in the Shema Israel, Deuteronomy, and you love the Lord your God with all your hearts. In Hebrew it says, it's not levavcha. Libcha is your heart. Levavcha is both hearts. What do I mean both hearts? Both hearts, I have only one heart. No. You have one heart that is connecting to the soul, that is the good inclination. And another part is the part of the heart that connects to the evil inclination, to the body dimension. So when you say you should love God with both your hearts, with the good and with the evil, to love God with the good, that's simple, okay? Uh, everyone has a moment in which I just want to love, I just want to be good, I just want to feel good, and I just want to be a great, good person. That's simple. But to take the dark side, to take our evil side, and to understand that my job in this world is to transform it, not to avoid it. Transform it. Transform it, convert it into love. All the dark side. So then, which means with both your inclinations. Uh, so basically, this is the main message of this parasha. The message is that we are humans. He cannot have it once and for all. Mount Sinai revelation was not supposed to solve all of humanity's problems in one short blow. It was supposed to show us that we can reach the heavens. And then when we come back with that memory, now it's easier to fight the illusions of the earth. Now, there's a great saying in the uh, sages that say, Kadma Tufa Lamaka. God always brought the remedy to be there before the plague, before the, the disease. Which means if you're looking for the remedy, you look around and you'll find it already. So uh, the chapter 32, verse one, that's the beginning of the story of the, no, chapter 32, verse 18. That's the beginning of the story Chapter 32, verse 1, I'm sorry. That's the beginning of the story of the uh, golden calf story. Okay? But that's not the beginning of the parasha. The beginning of the parasha is a lot before. That's in chapter 30, verse 11. What are, is the parasha talking about before? If we, saying, if we are saying that God always brings the remedy before the disease, if the disease is the blow, the golden calf, so you have the remedy in the parasha before that story. So we will start in chapter 30, verse 11. So we can count from here few, like really the most powerful remedies that we can have against that idea of the golden calf, which means uh, being awarded like a connection to eternity, Mount Sinai Revelation, and then betraying that. And usually people do that daily. We betray the gift of life, the gift of happiness, the gift that God gave us, the gift of a, of a soul that has the capacity to enjoy his light. And how many times a day do we forget it? And we just go astray and we find ourselves worshiping anger, fear, hatred, all kinds of other stupidities. We all do that. Why are we doing it? 
because it's not that we are so horrible. It's because this is our je- destiny. This is our job. This is our calling to take the mundane, the physical, the uh, stupid, the disconnected, and connect it and turn it and culture it. So now it functions properly. So here we're starting with a few topics. The first topic is the mitzvah of half a shekel. What's, what is this mitzvah? There are many aspects to this mitzvah, but it's a, the mitzvah of half a shekel is a, a mitzvah that was a, a started in the desert that every one of the Israelites had to give a donation of half a shekel for the tabernacle. And that mitzvah continued for many, many years. As long as the temple was standing, they, that was a yearly uh, yearly uh, donation of half a shekel that every head gave to the temple in order to pay for the public's offerings and maintenance of the temple. The question is, why half a shekel? You give, and give a whole shekel already. The half a shekel, we're talking shekel means uh, it is basically um, the word shekel, which means weight, is uh, in the ancient times that was around 22 grams of silver. So when you want to give half a shekel, and usually the time is to do it before uh, Purim, once a year. So after the destruction of the temple, it became like giving half a shekel for the community's needs once a year. So we're going back to the question, why half a shekel and why silver? Why not gold? So the answer is like this. The, the, the metal that is silver symbolizes right column, chesed, loving and giving. That's why the holy shekel in the temple was silver and not gold. Why half a shekel? So the Torah says very clearly that the shekel had 20 units, 20 gera. Today, the, the uh, let's say the modern Israeli shekel is divided like many uh, currencies around the world into 100 agorot. But the, the shoresh, the source of the same of the word is the same. The, the unit is called gera in the Bible and today agora. So this, this, it's the same root. Why 20, why not 100? Why not 24, like uh, one shillings, I think it was something like this. And the answer is, and that's what the Zohar is teaching us. When you want something, uh, you want a life, you want a job, you want a, a spouse, you want a child, you want to have a home. How do you imagine it? Do you want it? How much do you want it from one to 10? You know, a normal human being will say, I will do my best to get it 10. 10. Why 10? Mount Sinai Revelation, 10 utterances. The world was created by 10 sayings of the Creator. 10 sefirot, 10 illuminations of the tree of life. So when you want something, it's built in, in every human being, you want it 10. Okay? However, if you want it 10, there is a problem. As Rabbi Ashlag, the founder of the modern Kabbalah movement and the commentator of the Zohar says, the moment the universe was created the way we know it, I want, I desire that concept cannot be a vessel for bliss. Why? So we explain. The bliss is coming from the eternal light of the creator. The eternal light of the creator is all about light. It's all about eternity. Now there's a rule in this universe, which is the rule of similarities attract, which means like oil and water cannot be mixed. Okay, you need some other substance 
to put them together, like soap or like uh, emulsifier, but they don't mix oil and water. Same thing, eternal and finite do not mix. The moment you say, I want, I desire, what do you desire? Doesn't matter. I want my food to be 10. I want my home to be 10. I want my spouse to be 10. I want my child to be 10. The moment I have that desire, the moment I want it and I want it 10, in that moment, it's finite. Why? I want it the way I want it. And I want it to myself. I want it to feel it's mine. I want to have ownership. I want my desire to be fulfilled. What's the problem? The moment you want it, you want it for yourself. That's finite. Because the light travels and then fills it up, fill yourself up, and there's a stop to it. That's how much I want it. I don't want it infinite. So finite, because it stops with me. The money gets to me. The joy gets to me. The pleasure is I enjoy it, and that's it. The moment we are in the frequency of I want it to myself, this is the highest definition of evil. So when you say in Hebrew, ra, evil, it's an issue of ratzon atzmi, selfish desire. When you say an evil person, rasha, it's an issue of ratzon shel atzmo. What makes him evil? that he's focused all around his own desires. And that's why the sages are saying, Reshaim bechayehem nikraim etim. Evil people are dead while they're still alive. Why? Because the moment they are focused all the time about the 10 they want for themselves, they are disconnected from the infinite light of the creator, and that is death, for sure. Oh, but they're still alive. Yeah, it's like sometimes you take the plug out, and the some machines, that is still some... They, they, it doesn't stop immediately. There's a kind of a diminishment till it's dead, finally. So, if you want to live... You have to build another 10. These 10 are called the 10 lights of giving, the 10 lights of returning light. When we are really busy, whatever we want to have, we want to have in order to have others enjoy of it too. The moment I create that direction, not from outside to me, but for me, to others, how much do you want to give it to others? You should want it 10. When you work on building the 10 sefirot of giving, you created a true vessel that can contain the light of receiving. This is the secret of the half a shekel. So when we wonder how do we build a light, a heart, um, a heart that is a vessel to receive God's light is when I take those ten sefirot of me, 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 and I turn them into us. You want your life to be better? Make other people's life better, too. How much you want it for yourself? Ten? So make sure that you do it ten for others. Service. Caring. Helping. Being there for somebody. It's not just a volunteering, just, you know what, leave volunteering. The simple tasks you have daily with your family members, with your colleagues, with your customers, suppliers, with everyone. Just do 10 of giving. And remember, those 10 build the vessel after the creation of the universe. This is the rule. You build the vessel of 10 sefirot of giving. They stay forever. Then you turn yourself from finite to infinite. Because every desire to receive you have for yourself, you turn into a desire to help others. Then it becomes desire to receive for the sake 
of sharing. That is infinite. You turn yourself from ratzon, desire, into tsino, same letters in Hebrew, a pipe. How much liquid can the pipe connect to? Infinite, theoretically. What does that mean? You want to build yourself away from the, the uh, sin of the golden calf? Start working on building those half a shekel uh, consciousness system in yourself, which is the more you want it for yourself, the more you want it for others. So, and what it says, verse uh, 12, when you give this half a shekel, there won't be a plague among those people because you are protected when you create that vessel of 10 sefirot of the tree of life, 10 sefirot of giving. So remember again, when we give to others, when we care for others, we don't do any favors to them. We should be thankful for them for giving us the opportunity to build our half a shekel. As we said, the shekel is 20 gira, 10 of the desire to receive, 10 of the desire to give. When I have both, only then I can keep the, the fulfillment without that fading away. Because if it's only just receiving for myself, infinite and finite, they don't go together. You stay always empty. Then comes on ver uh, page uh, chapter 30, verse 17, speaking about building the uh, copper basin from which the Kohanim were washing their hands. The copper basin was built from the mirrors of the ladies. The women in the uh, in the congregation. You know, at that time, there was the, you know, the, what we have today, a mirror that is made of a glass and a silver lining on the other side, uh, did not exist at that time. So they were like polished copper as mirrors for the women. You know how a woman, she needs that mirror. The women were asked to give their copper to build the basin. So every time the women came to the tabernacle and they saw how the Kohen, how the Kohanim, the priests, washing their hands and legs, each one said, that's made from my mirror. Which means even small actions of giving, they get together and become something of really meaningful. Which, and then you feel a part, you can participate. Even you just gave your copper mirror, you know, for women, that could be the most precious uh, stuff to give up. Uh, somebody else will say, oh, that's just a piece of uh, copper. But that giving can really make a difference. Then comes the uh, the next uh, thing. So we have the half a shekel. We have the small actions of giving that can make a difference that so it's two, already two concepts that will help us to get rid of the golden calf syndrome, which means, yeah, I know the truth. I studied, I studied spirituality, Kabbalah, I even had a meditation, and I really connected to God. And then two minutes later, somebody got me upset, and I forgot the whole thing. You need to have this gradual structure of getting out of negativity, and that's okay. That's how it should work. Then the Moses is coming with another uh, mitzvah, verse 22. By the way, and God spoke to Moses, saying, take incense, all kinds of spices, and then take pure olive oil, mix them together and make the holy ointment. The holy ointment to anoint, to anoint what? 
to anoint the tabernacle, to anoint the ark and the table and all the utensils of the tables and the menorah and all its uh, utensils and the incense altar and the big altar of the offerings and all its utensils. And you sanctify them and they will be holy of holies. And you also anoint Aaron, the high priest, and his sons, and you anoint them to serve me. So now this is a concept. We spoke about it last week. It's about anointment. When we are realizing that everything around us has to be sanctified by, by dedicating it. And the Zohar says, today you don't need the ointment. Just speaking is enough. The speaking is when you prepare for Shabbat and you say, this is Lichvot Shabbat Kodesh, in honor of the Holy Shabbat. When you, everything that, when you build the house, and you put the cornerstone, and you say this house with your mouth, is putting the cornerstone. And you say this house is going to be to serve just holiness by whatever is going to be done in this house. You already anoint it. With the speaking, with the words, you have the ability to anoint everything around you. And that is a very important thing because that's how you sanctify what's around you. And little by little, everything becomes more and more connected to the tree of life, less darkness, more light, more purity. Then, so that's another thing. Then comes the, on verse 34, chapter 30. The incense. The story of the incense, the Zohar does not speak about it in Parashat Kedisah, but in the next parasha, Parashat Vayakel. The Zohar says, just reading uh, the, uh, the story of the incense, you have it in every uh, Jewish, every Hebrew prayer book, in the beginning of the morning prayers, you have the story of the uh, incense. Today, a lot of people, they buy it even written on the parchment, uh, and they read from that. And that is really, it has the power, the sgula, to protect from us from evil, from negativity. After that, chapter 31, we have about anointing. And it's not anointing, but it says, call karati b'shem, calling the two, uh, the two uh, uh, craftsmen that made the temple, that built the temple. And God said, I gave them into their heart, the ability to do, to build a temple. And the sages are saying that to explain to us, why is God saying that, you know, in the time, the messianic age, then the Jewish people are going to become mamlechet koanim, a kingdom of priests. There's no place in uh, the temple for millions of people. How can everybody pre pre priest? So Rabbi uh, Ashlag is saying, when every person is in his job serving the community like a priest in the temple, and it doesn't matter if you are a builder, if you are a carpenter, if you are a computer person, if you are a clerk, it doesn't matter. The moment, just think about it. If every person on earth takes his job seriously and does it like a priest in the temple with honesty, with dignity, with service, with love and with care, this is messianic age. Because we humans on earth, we do not suffer from anything because of a lack. Today, especially not. It's very clear. We, we can build enough housing for every human being. We can grow and create enough food for every mouth. So why is it that there's so much suffering on earth? Because people do not realize that each one of us is a priest 
in God's temple. When we understand that, that's we can overcome everything. You don't have to wait for the others to do that. Just do it yourself for your own self, because that's how you connect yourself to eternity and to the tree of life. And then it ends with the Shabbat. It's a sign between you and, and between me and you. Why? Because I am God. I am you being sanctified by the Shabbat. So if you want to sanctify yourself, the Shabbat, once a week, stop everything. All the addictions, to screens, to worrying, and just be busy one day with study, holiness, and so on. We just gave a list of the most powerful tools of consciousness in order to overcome that part inside us that creates golden calves uh, on a constant base. Thank you so much and all the best.